Okay, we're going to start this over. Yep. Uh, it's 535. This is Councilor David McBride. We're going to call the meeting of the Property Readers Committee to order. It's Wednesday, January 18th. First order of business is to call to order. Uh, myself, President, Councilor Bordelot is present. Um, Larry Dunn, Bob Frank, and Hal Zada are present. And Councilor Westervelt is coming in and out. Uh, he's having some difficulties to get in. We'll keep an eye out for him. First order of business is uh, anyone, any public comment from anyone? There are a couple of individuals, individuals listed. If you would like to speak, please either raise your hand or put your uh, device that they would like to speak, but I don't see anything, so we'll move on. Next order of business is communications. Do you want to offer, I, I'm sorry, do you Go want ahead. to offer uh, Lauren Goff here a chance to speak if she wanted? No yeah, public comment? Yeah. No. Okay. okay. Sorry, Lauren. Sorry. Uh, We're so used to looking on there only. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Next is uh, rule of minutes. I'm going to skip over. I was hoping to have that completed today, but ran into some issues today, so I wasn't able to. I will bring that um, bring that copy for the next meeting. Next order of business is the old business, town owned property reuse evaluation process. The current draft is in the handout. Um, and then the next item of importance is the current updated PowerPoint presentation. If everyone's had an opportunity to review it. I'm not sure if you want to walk through that, Bob, since you have you've made the most recent changes that we've um, that we've sent to you okay. to incorporate. Probably spend a few minutes on that, but I'd like to not not go into too much detail. I think that PowerPoint's in pretty good shape um, where it stands. But let's go maybe do a flip side by page by page. Just All right. So I'm going to share the screen. Yes, that'd be great. Committee member uh, John Goodrich has just arrived as well. Sorry for being late, guys. So can we just start? Yeah, if you can share your screen, we'll go through that. Yeah, let me see if I I I, I did. Now I've got so I got your screen. There you go. You're coming through. Is that now. it? Okay. There we go. All right. So uh, no changes here. No changes here. No changes here. Big changes here. Okay, this is uh, Larry put this together uh, in response to the request for a uh, rundown of all town property. So he worked with the town staff and Larry, if you want to talk about this, go right ahead. But uh, he worked with the town staff on this uh, last week, spent a lot of time on it. Uh, so there's used, unused, used, unused and used, and then uh, other down here. So I don't know, Larry, you want to say anything about this? Yeah, only that um, this is like a year and a half, two years in the making where we finally have, an, a, have a baseline of town owned property that we can determine by deed research uh, on restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. So we just this last week completed the final review with the town staff so that between, uh, I guess the Conservation Commission was doing it because of protected spaces. Uh, so you'll notice the date of January 12th. So we're doing a baseline and obviously you get adds and deletes and changes over time. So we've set up a process. This gets fed into the GIS database. There is a lag of <laughs> sometimes many weeks. Um, so we've got a working copy database that feeds the GIS database, uh, and this information has come out of that. Now we've changed the definitions because they were very confusing. And rather than spending time to, to say, well, dedicated town dedicated open space isn't really dedicated open space. So we've agreed that th this is much more simple. Uh, so town property that's used and unused. Unused is the vacant category, if you will, in the database and is the numbers are the same, by the way, pretty close. Um, and I think uh, Councilor Bordelon asked for some information. So there's a bit more detail uh, and we can now sort and search on almost any question you would like, uh, including, you know, based upon the fire district and other things that determine what's where. Uh, in the database, there's also city, state, uh, public property uh, uh, 490 and 
in Gosa and Avalonia and other things to get a full picture. So this is uh, town owned, and you'll see at the very bottom are some of that additional information. So any any questions on this, or you know, is this too much detail or just the right amount? So I'm open for for questions. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for you know uh, taking that you know uh, thought process and putting it to paper because if nothing else, if we decide not to use it in our slideshow, it'd be great to add it into the the, the final document. That was, um, if we decide to stream slide it down, but at a first glance, it may look overwhelming if it's going to be on a slideshow. But to process it now and discuss it as a committee, I think it's a lot of information that's great, and it really helps us to kind of uh, see the town in a snapshot lens of what we're dealing with, what we have. And I think this information could be generated and purpose, purposely used in the you know, uh, final draft document. But I'm not sure. I look for suggestions from the committee as to how you want to use this information um, on the slide. But again, thank you to Larry for you know, really digging through this. And uh, it helps me to understand because you know, this is not something I'm as familiar with. I know the basic stuff, like we have this property or that property. But now I have a reference where I can quickly look and I can kind of start to think and see how we're doing it in Grant. So uh, thank you for your efforts. I have a question. I know we talked about underutilized property. Is there ever a chance that any of this used property, such as the public works, can be considered unutilized at some point if we pulled out the used differently? Well, the, by definition, you'll notice that there's six former schools which would have been used, but because they were decommissioned, they're now considered unused. So the answer is yes, um, except, <laughs> again, there's legal processes. When you have preserved and protected property, you know, there's some legal uh, hurdles if somebody wants to reclassify those. But the other two categories, you know, the public school, schools, public works, Right. Those uh, are obviously, you know, within the ability of the town to recategorize. You, you could, someone could claim that a used property is underutilized, right? That's that, that's yeah. 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 That can be just kind of a voyage of discovery as you get to it. So we're looking for more room for something. First thing we will turn to is look at our already used properties and see if they can be used more efficiently. That's that's the low hanging fruit. What uh, what we could do with these is pie charts. You know those circle pie charts that show the breakout by percent instead of listing it in text. Just a thought. I, I'm just wondering for simplicity. That's a question and observation. We just kind of. It's great to have this information for our knowledge. I don't think it's what we want to put in the presentation. I mean, does it open up too many questions? What do you guys think? I, I completely agree. I just think that I don't want to lose a, a single word of this in terms of the knowledge, because this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But in terms of who the audience is that we're going to be trying to, this is going to be presented to, this level of granularity is way beyond anything that they'll need for making a decision. We want to just what we're trying to do is say, here's how much we own. It's a lot. Here's how many pieces it is. That's a lot. Here's how much we can't, aren't really going to be dealing with. That's a lot. It's, it's kind of very generalities we're talking down to. So I think if this can be sifted way down, I don't know if we want to do it at this meeting or just kind of throw stuff up. I mean, I look at it and came up with you know, three major headers because all I want to say is Town of owns this many acres and this many parcels. It's got a great little number in there and say that's 12% of the land of the town of Groton, which by the look up is actually the entire peninsula of Groton, not including the land that we own that's underwater, which is a thing too. That's and correct. It does, not, yeah, it does not include that uh, underwater right. land. Yep. That's just there. So, and then and 190 acres of it is un, unused for a few poor parcels. That's, that's, that's the kind of big, bold thing they want to know. Little break down there, say, okay, 77, 76 acres with buildings, 130 acres, because they don't need the, the percentage point number, just big round numbers, 113 acres without buildings, with no deep conservation easement restriction. Great subtitle there. 
that's kind of the core of it. And pretty much everything else is kind of the gravy. I think it's for comparison's sake, I think you were saying that what's that compared to the rest of the property we own? That's the other parts that are there. That's terrific. 2,329 acres are currently in use and 3,879 are protected, preserved, or government land elsewhere that the town doesn't own. Perfectly valid. So when you look at this, at first glance, you will say, hey, look, unused stuff is a small percentage. Don't get scared that we're going to mess up with the town. We're not even dealing with half of it we don't even have control over. So those are, those are kind of vital questions that this thing can do. But I don't think we need to get into, uh, for the, the other 3,879 3, acres, I don't think we care how many parcels are there. It's not information we can use. It's not information the council will be able to use. For most of it, and for the, uh, the individual parcels, doesn't really make much difference. It's, uh, you know, who's what goes to the state university magnet school? What goes to the training? It's just we need to be able to generalize this stuff. It's nice to know as to how much of it is kind of open. So that's one way we could also just kind of sit it down. At first glance, take a look at it and say before somebody starts asking, oh no, we want to preserve all those things for open space. In one fell swoop, we can see on here how much open space we already have. And what kind of dent any of this would make on it. That's a decision they can way off the top. But most of the other stuff, most of the other details that we can look out of it, just so we get to get the super important headers on one line will break down. It still could be quite a few few lines, but pretty much there's three major. How much do we own? And how many parcels, how many parcels? Because that's Tells you how big how big a problem it is to deal with. How many are unused? And how many parts? How many acres unused? And how many parcels? Break that down into two lines if you want. Sounds fine. And how many acres are currently in use? And how many parcels? And that's kind of the most important stuff. So anything else you need to really take a look at how much we're going to populate that slide because it's just way too much information that they can't use at the meeting that they're, this is being presented at. They'll use it in the future, but at the meeting where we, this will be presented, this doesn't do them any good. So, so I would agree with that in that some of this information needs to be streamlined in this document, but I do think it's important to retain this at the end of the document as an appendix, similar to what we did with some of the details that Larry put together as well. Okay. Is that what we're talking about, kind of yeah. heading in that direction? Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Councilor McBride. I think there's a lot of great information, and I, I also agree with uh, the speaker before you. Um, I think this is a lot of great information. I also think this this, this committee that's going to be together, that's going to be meeting, however frequent, they will be looking at the flows and you know peaks of where the land is moving from unused to used, and this could be like a format document where they can start to adjust that so that they're you know kind of looking and seeing and collaborating. Um, but I, I do think we could maybe lessen the slide uh, for the context in which we are we are presenting. And but keeping the information and uh, uh, elsewhere. OK, so just just to back up, so to make sure I'm on the right page, the unused section is really what we're focusing on. Correct. That's the low hanging fruit. I mean, that's what that's what the council is going to want to know is the details be the unused, the schools and the others. So I guess my question is, should the detail to that component be in this presentation, or that's just going to be at the end? Well, how much detail for this presentation do you actually need? Because mostly it's, I think it's, you know, do they care how big the parcels are? I mean, ranging from 0.3 to 36.7 acres spread over the town. Does it matter? It doesn't matter to us, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter to anyone else. Well, it's two it's two pages, right? Larry, page 23 and 24 is your total, your unused yeah. property details. They're, they're, at the, they're at the bottom or in the attachment. So those are all the, you know, there's three slugs of data there. Um, the left side, the right side, that's a continuation. I got you. Okay. So, so maybe what we'll do, how does this sound? If we if we revise this to be in summary mode, 
keep the details of it in an appendix, call it appendix B. But then when we mention the unused 189 acres, reference appendix A, which is going to be the three slugs you just mentioned as appendix A. So that way, if they, they see the unused 189 acres, they can see the detail of the 189 acres, and then they can also see the detail of all of this information at the end of the PowerPoint as well. So we'll have it in the PowerPoint, but we're not going to discuss it. It's just going to be in there. Because so I think as everyone, go ahead, Bob. Is this uh, Appendix B? Yeah, oh, we'll, no, we'll, un we'll refine unused. it. Unused. This unused document, this, is the this appendix. Page, yeah, this page 15 is going to be summarized to be Town of Groton. Correct, you, know, you guys jump in if I'm wrong, but my understanding is page 15 is going to be Town of Groton owns 246 acres as far as of blank. We're going to focus on the unused portion of it, and then we're going to say for additional information, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to focus on the unused portion of it. Fix your, you know, put in a couple bullet points. For additional information pertaining to the unused details, please see Appendix A. That's going to be page 23 and 24. And then the next bullet point will be for additional information on used or other information on a governmental preserve, please see Appendix B, which will be all of this detail. So are we directing people to appendices in the presentation? It's not a handout. It's well, a we'll handout. say presentation then we'll we'll have to word it somehow different yeah. but it'll be at the end of the presentation it's not going to be maybe at the end of the presentation we'll have supplemental information um, forward or some information to follow and it'll be there for them to review we're not going to talk about it okay. but everybody's done a lot of work and it makes sense to have this data oh yeah um is that kind of what we're thinking well yeah i mean because right since we're taking the first stab at like presenting to the council i think it's important to show the work we've done and even though we're not going to discuss it all, I think, it, you know, because obviously we're, we're working on a, a final document. So any work that we're doing, you know, it will be in the final document. But yeah, I, I'm open to any suggestions you guys have. You know, I think it's, you know, it's great either way. I, I do like the, the, the division that I, I, even my summary used the same division under unused. One thing you can divide out is 76 acres with buildings and the other without buildings. That's That's a nice thing. Because those are two very different things, especially yeah. total acreage. So that division is, makes perfect sense to leave in there as it is. How many parcels? Doesn't matter. Well, actually, I actually left the parcels in there too, because that gives you an idea how small some of them are. Right. And then can refer to the supplemental information for more detail. It's all there. We're good. Larry, Bob, good with that approach? Scott? That's fine. Okay. Uh, I like to. <laughs> I'll go with whatever you want, but I, in a way, I like the slide. So some of what Portia said, this does reflect some serious work done by this committee, or at least by Larry Dunn and his conservation commission. And uh, that could uh, lend some confidence into what we're doing, you know, that it's a serious look at town property. That's all. Well, maybe if we could summarize it better for this slide into maybe the total right. bullet point, the total bullet point, then maybe a bullet point for use, and maybe a bullet point for other information. And then well, the fourth bullet point being unused and then giving the detail there, because that's the focus of this committee at the current time. But I, I, I kind of agree with what you're saying. It's just, it's a lot to have in this PowerPoint. It is, it is that is true. What do you okay. think, Larry? Well, I, I think there is too much information uh, and might distract from the purpose, which is what are we doing about unused property? So uh, you know, that needs to be the focus. So I think the first two bullets are the key and they can be simplified a little bit. And the other bullets can be an attachment, I think, as was as was mentioned. It's fine. All right, we have a question for, comment from Lauren. All right, so Dave, you and I will get together to finish this up, or what's going to happen? How are we going to work? We, this? Yep, we will, Bob, but just want to recognize Lauren's uh, commenting. In order to catch you on the mic, you might have to just stand here. I apologize. Okay. They, yeah, because the mic is here. Yeah, yeah. If you want to sit or stand. Yeah, come over. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. But as a as like an end user of whatever presentation you're going to have, you're not presenting to me because I'm not on the council, but I'll be uh, who, referencing the PowerPoint. Speaking? 
Lauren Gauthier, I was in the audience here. Um, so anyways, I, I think a pie chart would actually be a really nice visual um, way to consume all of this information. I think someone, I think Bob brought it up to begin with. You have the pie chart that has the acreage, and that's a really good way to look at the fact that the unused property is such a small piece here. But I, I'm not saying ditch all of the amazing work. It's it's easy enough to put a pie chart up and discuss it because you're this is a verbal presentation, but then have the slide there just to go back and reference because you know you, you have the hard data there. You don't have to read it, but you can see the pie chart and talk about the data. It, does that make sense? Yes, that makes yeah. sense to me. Okay, but well, Bob, we can work on that. Yeah, so, uh, okay, okay. Yep. The only point I want to make about all the information, I'm trying to put myself as an end user, is I think it's too much is open up to make questions. Like my question, hey, can some of that property that's used be considered underused? Or the point I brought up at the last meeting, oh, I know it's been protected. We take it out of the status to build a school there. I, I think it's like, so what we're trying to do, which is dealing with the unused property. So I think for that reason, it's too much information, but that's just, that's my opinion. Well, I think we're, I think we're all on the same page on minimizing this, okay. right? Including I mean, I do think if we take it, yeah, I think the pie chart could make it not going to lead to as many distractions. It was just kind of, you know, it's a quick slide. First, that's the property, you know, pie chart. We have this, we have this, we have this, next slide. Like it was really, you know, you don't have to go in like you say to all the great detail. It just uh, it can be added at the end. But uh, excuse me, we're getting a lot of background of somebody's chopping. chopping on a cutting board, <laughs> cooking. <laughs> Who's making dinner? Somebody, whoever could mute, that would be great. <laughs> uh, I apologize. That was me and my dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's making me hungry, counselor. <laughs> okay, Sorry so we're good. That. No, that's okay. We're on our way. Just what are you making us? We'll take delivery. What uh, if, if there's a concern that you want to make sure that the, the council knows how much went into doing this, we could follow that chart, this tremendously abbreviated couple of things, and just then just throw in the big list. I won't read it. I don't expect it to read it. It's just so in a, it's a talking point. Say mm -hmm. it's 48 parcels. Here's what it looks like to have them going through. Nobody's expected to read it, but that way you can at least, you're, you're, a little, if there's a little concern over it not looking like we did much except for put together a PowerPoint, then that's a good point. We can just kind of say, okay, here you go, here's what it looks like. And we'll be kind of going through these. You can mention what our headers are, but I don't think you need to. It'll just be a, a graphic view of all these different parcels that are being talked about. Well, Bob, you and I will. Put this together before the next meeting and, and summarize this in a little di different format with a pie chart and okay. try to make this page a little less busy, but to make sure we don't lose the important data that, that Larry's put together. That sound like a plan? Yeah. Any maybe other comments? Might, okay, good. Sounds good. All right. So okay. the next one, uh, no change, no change, no change. Uh, the, right here, the last one we did was this right here. Next step. That's that was a change on this one. Okay. All right. It's it's not on the screen, but I think everybody has it. Oh, you don't see it? No, it's okay. I think we have the paper. Everybody have it. I thought it was sharing here. All right, next one. Well, if you have changes, why don't we quickly look at it? You have incorporate council comments. Which which uh, form are we on? Next, next, step. next steps, yeah. page 20. Under 11 on our back. 11, yeah. Because this is where we're at right now. Present to council, we get their comments. We are developing the RFP process. So you're uh, looking I think at we the document? Yes, looking at the document 11 or page 22, depending upon what you reference. I think we do want to add, you have review other municipality RP proposals and reach out to see, I think we wanted to incorporate 
uh, what Lauren had sent along as well, which was OPM documents or OPM procedures or what was OPM? Uh, so the link I had sent was the OPM procurement standards. Yes. And then um, a link to some training that they have. Um, we can say OPM related procurement information or something similar. Mm -hmm. And then we state, we meet once every third. Any other comments on next steps? That's where we're at. Should it also say that we're going to review the municipality RFP proposal, other as well as our own current? Good point. Yep. Review. Are, are we re reviewing? We said what? that here at the communities. Oh, wow. Well, well, she's saying current because we are reviewing our current, our past, I guess it was our past. Review past uh, Town of Groton. Oh, okay. Town of Garden RFP submittals. Other municipality RFP proposals. Okay, yeah. I can work with you on that slide too. Um, any other comments on next steps? Okay. Okay. And I'll need to find out from the town manager when we can present this. I'll reach out to him tomorrow. No change to this. No change to this one. Uh, I don't think we had any change to this, although that might have been this fourth bullet might have been might be new, but I don't I don't think I think that's no change there. Okay, then a big change. Have... Pardon? Same thing. Okay. Page 11. You're finishing up next steps. Oh, oh, next steps are good. I think we're good. Is everyone good? Unless you have, did you have a comment, Bob? Uh, well, we're going to talk about the RFP process. I, I've, I uh, listened again to the, uh, to what I think what Hal was saying last time about, you know, there's the RFP itself. And then there's uh, the process that it fits into, which is to me, the uh, land disposition process, starting with, you know, the TOPE makes a recommendation maybe or somebody, or, you know, there's some kind of visioning process going on for, for land reuse. And, and, it's, and, and it graduates to an RFP, you know? You know, you have visioning of what, what could be possible on this property say then then there's conceptual plans and from conceptual plans you would you would then if the community agrees or whatever you would go out with an rfp and throughout each one of those you have to think about what is the town council's involvement in each one of those phases and more importantly what is the public's involvement okay when is the public informed that a, that a property is being really considered for disposition? And when are the neighbors informed specifically? Okay. So, I mean, I'm just thinking it's it, it, when I talk about the RFP process, that's what I'm thinking of. It's not just the RFP document. No, that's a good point. And maybe since you mentioned that, maybe in the next steps, we, we bullet point what you're referring to as continue developing the RFP process and indent some bullet points on exactly what you're referring to, because there are different phases of what we're working on. Yeah, that, so- that, I think you made some good points. So why don't we put this in this document? If, we, if we're, I mean, if we're in agreement that we're not doing just the process itself or just the, you know, the boilerplate document. So, why don't we have some discussion on that, Bob? Why don't you rephrase that so we can kind of uh, review that again? Because it sounds like what you're saying is a few different phases of the process. Right, right. So, so it's not just the, the the end product. Right, right. There, there's there's meetings. There's you know like it's it, this can, there's uh, visioning. Let's say hopefully this vision. This property could be ball fields. 
It could be for recreation of ball fields. Okay. So then you narrow that down and, and uh, you, you come up with uh, conceptual plans for, well, there could be two baseball fields and one soccer field. There could be two soccer fields and something else. You know, those are conceptual plans. And all along the way, you've got public engagement and town council engagement. And then at some point it starts to gel. And you say, okay, if we're gonna do this, we've got to go out for an RFP. You know, or- right, but you're referring to the, the timing of the TOPE process. No, the, the, TOPE, the TOPE is already determined. They've come to some conclusion that uh, it's it, it should be for recreation. Or, and maybe they've already done this. Is that what you're saying? The TOPE already did that? Well, I think there's gonna be two different situations. Sometimes the, the TOPE would already do that, but there's gonna be also times when that, that they meet quarterly, whatever it is, and they look to see if they wanna do something with the property. Yeah, because because I don't see this as meeting quarterly. This that this is, I mean, look at the uh, Claude Chester School. I mean, right now is that what we're doing? Are we visioning there? Right? What's happening? Are we we're visioning. And True. At some some point, you know, there's a, a part of the Parks and Rec uh, study survey. Uh, so that's visioning to me. And then and that then we come to conceptual plans. Now I don't think the top. I thought the TOPE was coming out with high level ideas. You know, they weren't going to do a lot of research, high level ideas. Yeah, it should be ball fields of some kind or not. Okay, so then we start have, the vision. Uh, one second. Uh, John has, has had his hand up for So, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding was twofold. So, let's say, for example, Lauren's a developer and she says, hey, I'm interested in this piece of property and I want to build X, Y, and Z. Isn't part of the reason this has been formed to make sure that we don't have a replay where there's an issue with the developer, the public's not notified till it's too late. I, I thought part of this reason this committee was formed was to make sure that doesn't happen. So it sounds yes. like you have two roles. That's the RFP process. Right. Well, right. What I think he's referring to is before you get to that actual process, some of the stages before that actual formal RFP process. Well, some some could argue. And I'll speak for myself. Again, I don't speak on behalf of the whole council. I speak as an individual counselor. I feel the Claude Chester thing is starting down the same trend. There's been no community involvement. And it's no disrespect to any of the counselors or anybody else, but I thought there should be a community engagement before those three or four designs came to us a couple of weeks ago. Um, they were using old data from 2020 where we have a huge inflation cost and a bunch of other things since COVID have changed. And they had a meeting that had 50 something people in attendance, 20 of them are some form of an elected official or serve on some boards and commission. Maybe even 25 if I had to guess even further, possibly even 30 if you start counting open space and all that. Out of that 50 people that showed up at the senior center that night, Maybe 10 were new faces of people that don't already have uh, some political say in something. That information was used. And now we have four or three, I don't know if it's three or four, I apologize, conceptual plans from all that data from a, uh, from a survey from 2020. And it's you know designed, it's mattered what's flash pad here or what's flash pad at our quote unquote community center, which has not come before us yet with the final document to tell us how the layout is gonna work in a conceptual plan for that. Ever since I've been elected now almost six years, the community center has been kind of sitting here. And so they said, oh no, we're gonna go for grant money to the state and we're running out of time. Claude Chester would be a great property. And I put up a community center. They said, there's no plan yet for the community center. Why? How many years have we been waiting? That would have been a great thing to, people have already agreed to this, we paid for a roof. So my concern is, this is another great example of the ball already rolling, in my opinion. It's not the community to say, no, we're not having that. But we need to bring the community around a little bit earlier to start involving them in the discussion now. Um, and we didn't have any dollar amounts. So people are, and when they came to those forums, they were putting stickers on the board, no criticism of the work of the town, because that was a great, uh, that was a great uh, appetizer for the event to kind of feed our soul of what was coming. 
but people were putting stickers up. No one knew how much anything cost. Well, let's not go back there, Portia, because I want to try to move this meeting along. But I agree with your comments, and I think that's I think it's, I, I guess that's what, and, I, and I, sorry to be long-winded, I just try to get the vision. And the vision is, this is what the problem is. So I, I'm agreeing with uh, Bob in the sense, the same thing is, you know, where is the disconnect happening? How do we make sure, has planning and zoning looked at Claude Chester for what um, the little sticker chart has decided? Has Inlands and Wetlands looked at it? Has all the other agencies, now we have these conceptual drawings, and to my knowledge, no one's looked to make sure that those things can even go there yet. Well, well that's what we no discuss here. No one's the neighborhood, because I have people- but, let's, not, let's not digress on something that we have no control over that's already happened. We need to formalize this document. All the things you're saying yes. is correct, but let's let's get them into this document. That's that's right. I'm, I'm just true. using it as another example of what Bob is talking about, and I think that's what I'm hearing, is how do we wrap our head around that as a town so it's more transparent, open, and it's community engaging. Great. So that, that, that's that, that, that's exactly what he's talking about. So and, let's and get it up. Bringing there. inlands and wetlands and planning and zoning before you pay this money for this 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 dream that we've already designed and no one's even had a chance to bet it. Understood. Understood. So, so that's that's my concern. No, I, th I think that's concern valid, but let's not digress into yeah. where we're at another project because that's what our intent here is. If we can, if this was done, then what you're saying would have already been addressed to where we wouldn't be right now. So right. I understand your point. Lauren? So I, I think to, yes, do you like it or love it? It's very frustrating for people in the town. Uh, totally agree with all your comments, uh, Councilor Bordelon. And I think where, that disconnect is happening is I'm seeing it in this, um, I know folks online can't see, but in this layout here, you have a baseline RFP document, and I'm not exactly sure what generic RFP document should, but from this closure, if you tell me this is your process, you've got your RFP, and then you're going out with folks. That, that <laughs> Lauren's referring to page 10. Of the PowerPoint. So you're saying you've got, and that's, I think this is what is currently happening is somebody's got it in their head what's going to happen, and then they go out and say, Do you like it or love it? Whereas I think you want to flip these two. I think you want to have the TOE say and go through the process of evaluating what's planning and zoning say, what's wetland say, what is this maybe okay for, have a couple public hearings just right. with the neighborhood. I think you want the TOE involvement first, not the generic. RFP. Well, I think that's the slide before. So if you go to the slide before. This one? Well, we can't see your screen, but page nine is where we have the unused property okay. database. The TOPE meets quarterly. Huh. It says I'm sharing my screen. Yep, I can see it's it. It's okay. We're, we're, we're on page. Oh. We're on page nine. Uh, go ahead and share because it's a two-step project. <laughs> about, about the residents having an opportunity and this is just I guess a guy that's on both sides as a civilian and also as a member of a, a commission I, I think we have to find a way to make our meetings more accessible to the public I, I mean yes we arrange our schedule we can be here on Wednesdays at 5 or Tuesdays at 6 or 7 I think a lot of the community that is working has kids so we get on the list those are difficult times for them to come out so i think as we develop this process we have to give the community whether that be a saturday or sunday as much as that might mm -hmm. be difficult the opportunity to attend i think that's fair i think that's fair i mean 5 30 and 6 30 or not you know for the average which is the majority of your population are not able to attend they're just getting home from work trying to get the kids to bed or homework and so great maybe there's some way we, we need to work on making sure we're tapping into the needs of the community and the time and i do think there should be a, a weekend morning session or something or like that afternoon right or, yeah um but a, a tuesday night at the senior center at 5 30 or 6 is just hard for the average working person yeah those are good points let's digress back to where you were because i think you're on some because i think if you refer to page nine that's kind of where i think we were in terms of we're going to have the database of all the properties. And then if you look under the TOE committee meets quarterly, that's where residents are informed that the property is under review. Public comments are allowed. It's announced at tribal com, um, town committee meetings. 
so th this is the way that we envisioned it was it all of this involvement and review was happening before was going to town council and staff and then it and then we forward to recommendations to public comments and then the council makes a decision so you're saying this in blue here is what is currently happening no, this is something that we came up with. This is a process that and I, I don't have the color on page nine. We don't have anything mapped out what they used to do. Like it just with the whole. This is what this is what we're thinking should be done. This is our rough draft of what we're trying to figure out. So, as a layperson, y'all are going to meet every quarter, and you're going to say, "I've got these four on these properties." You're going to go to the town council, right? You're going to sit up here and say, "You've got 100 acres." Well, the there. town just to back up the town count. This top committee is going to meet. It's the top. That extensive token is going to meet quarterly. It may not have anything to do that night, but it's going to meet to allow for residents to come in and comment, public comment, developers' comments, review the parcels, so forth. But it's not, and, and, that doesn't move forward to council. It's just a meeting to and start. It's, it should be a time to collaborate through the different boards and commissions. So, right, this is the mm -hmm. first time you're having a council present with zoning and wetlands. We currently don't have that structure. So, I like to not think that even if there's no business, that it's going to be a waste. It's a collaboration. Planning and zoning might say, we got a new zoning regulation coming down from the state. Wetlands might say, hey, I'm concerned about this. So it'll be information grabbing. It's a good time to speak from as a whole. That's what I kind of so think. Is there, at what point does the TOEP committee report out to the, to the council? Or is that whatever counselor sits on the TOEP and then reports that out? That's if we get a developer that comes in and says, hey, I want to. So the, the instigation is a developer. Now that concerns me because there's a property on my mind. I don't know if y'all know, but I don't, I, as a resident, would I be able to come forward and say, I want to consider this property for a playground. I want the town to go through the entire process and examine this piece of property for a playground or park. So I'm not a developer, but why, why wouldn't I as... That's the purpose of the meeting. It's, it's, it's not as a developer. It could be, it, you know, it could be the town staff or could be look at the the the, the, uh, the schools that we have what are we doing with them? Mm -hmm. then in the Claude Chester example you're giving this group could have said let's let's start doing something with Claude Chester yeah. and then start the process that that we should be going with as opposed to what we're at right now okay and so I guess and I think we uh, sorry I think what you were saying about the whole it hasn't been determined in the document yet but I think there should be something in there where they're meeting quarterly, but how often are they coming to present where they're at, what information they took into the council? That is something that should be added for the document, that process. Um, because I think it's different when a committee comes to present versus an individual counselor, because it's hard not to put your own bias spin on it. Um, and as a counselor, it's hard for, for me to report um, based on it. But when you send committee to come with a small slideshow as such and just say, hey, we've had five residents come out with a concern about this section of town and this building and this land, you guys are reporting back. I'm not sure what that frequency is, and I'm sure it'll be determined by the council, but there should be something in our final document that talks about information we got and what are we doing? At a minimum of quarter. Yeah. And, yeah. And that would be the right time to say, okay, you could be you developer or be you neighbor eyeing a lot next door and say, I think that'd be a great place to put a playground. And the tope would be the one to say, okay, here's the pros and cons. Majority view is that that's a great idea for these reasons. The minority view is that's a terrible idea for these other reasons. Mm. And that's the report that would go forward. Mm. So it would be the pros and cons work the other way around too. So yes, there's an electrical generator there. We don't want to put anything like that for kids. Says you, I don't care. Says us, we don't care. That would be the report. So this gets back to Bob's original thought, what you were referring to a while ago, that there's a process be, you know, before and beyond the RFP document. So it's duplicative. It's not. The red one is just the. You didn't even. We didn't even work that one yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, if it's in red, it's just a bunch of like data load that no one's even vetted yet. Yeah, so page nine is the process that Bob's referred to, yeah. and page ten is the RFP process that we need to find to. Yeah. If if I could, on, on page nine, when we said uh, recommendation, public comments, th those recommendations are high level, right? It it could be recreation fields, it could be public housing, could be a lot of different things. Okay, but it has passed. Uh, 
planning, uh, zoning and wetlands. It, it, and we, we know the zoning and wetlands limitations. The TOPE has done that. Any any showstoppers in that area, right? That that. Well, you do that even them. even before the council and the staff review it. Is right, right. Part of, the the tope, part of the TOPE review is we've got a I've got a, a zoning person on on the TOPE committee. Yeah. Right? right. So, don't have so you would know you would know if there's a showstopper from a zoning standpoint. Right. So, for 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 yeah, use of I mean, the land. I mean, that's the objective of that committee to be well diverse and pull in all the experts in the various areas. Wouldn't it make sense to make sure that we somewhat like on the days and there's not a lot of work that the, the committee is kind of looking through the land and kind of seeing what its uses are, you know, as as as, a, as just busy work. So for example, you know, um, Mary Morrison, Mary Morrison is considered unlawful because they're worried about possibly an influx of more military. So it's not being used as a school, but it has not been turned over to the town. This group right now should already be talking planning and zoning, already be talking about planning. We should already know what the community wants there. We should already know what could be their feasibility. And that way when we're ready to offload it and it comes on to the, the town, back to town roles, we know exactly what we're going after versus being you know, proactive versus reactive versus, okay, I'm putting on RFP, I'd let, okay, it's in a vacant building, let's send something out. I think we should already be thinking five steps ahead. I thought that's what the quartering was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is. And maybe we need to add some flavor into here to right. explain that. But that is the purpose of the committee is to meet regularly and discuss those things. So we're so ways. we're not waiting years to right. do something. And that's going to help with the mapping of the town. There's a lot of a lot of negative comments I've heard. A lot of positive here is that Groton looks as if there was no beginning, middle, and end. And I think it's because where is our master plan? This committee would be helping to generate that master plan with the town. We would already know these five properties can be this, 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 and this, and this is what the community wants. This is what the neighbors have said. And there might be times that we're going to challenge the neighbors a little bit, say, well, this is what we really need. But we already did the public hearing and the back work, and now we're ready. Like, we're ready to go. And that's what brought in better. There might be only one of the terms you can actually use. This would not produce a, a town master plan. Town master plan is the plan of conservation development. That's what we got. But in terms of a master plan for vacant properties, right. that's what we can be chipping away at. That's the term to use. Right. It's a master planning thing saying, oh, yeah, possible playground, possible pool, possible thing. It's all as possible. So that's what a master plan is. Right. That's where you'd be directing things to go in the first place. So that few years from son of a gun, we got $20 million to do a pool. We're going to go, we'd have already done it. Right, and then this committee could already be seeking the input and having some form of hearings and saying to the council, hey, this property, we've heard from the town that they really want to kind of use it for something. I recommend you have a public hearing or thing now before there's any body interest. In it. Like start talking and open up that door. I have a question I want to throw to the group. Is it possible that we could present this to the council and see if they wanted to start this TOPE committee now prior to the finalization of the RFP process? Because shouldn't this be happening now? Absolutely. I know. Right. I mean, why not ask the council if they want to? Yeah, I think it's fair. A whole different thing. Which is going to take several months to do. Right. And I mean, this this is, right. and we kind of branched off into a different area, but this area I think we all agree is important, something that we should be doing now. So maybe that's part of the presentation of council is to see if they're willing to. So maybe under those next steps, that another bullet point and say rec reclamation, if it is the recommendation of the committee, that the recommendation from the committee is that we enact a TOPE committee now while developing an RF process. Yeah, I like so, when you're all set. So that there's already people, you know, I, I think it's a great, strong message. So my only thing on that, again, taken from the community side, mm -hmm. I'm very judicious of my words here. I, I think the community feels that there are certain town staff and maybe possibly certain town councilors that put us down a bad RFP process before. And maybe giving that up to them right now would not be the most transparent and best way to develop a new RFP process. Well, I think what my thought process was is that as we've gone through this RFP process, we realized that, as Bob indicated, it's not just the RFP document that counts. It's the review on a quarterly basis well before. And we go to, we reach out to council and we ask, can we start this now? Because although we're still working on the RFP document process. So the RFP, so the RFP would not be ready for quite some time, but so, the TOPE committee could be established. So we established a TOPE, but this 
the commission would still work with the RFP process. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, no, these people are critical too. Yeah. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah. Uh, so, a lot of conversation about the RFP uh but going back to the process that you were describing i just want to like offer a mindset shift um as something that came out of the if you look through the policy procurement documents um uh, not offering recommendations i guess this is thinking more about the rfp process that's more where my kind of expertise is but we're going to need that <laughs> so, um, i think making it clear in the public involvement section that we're looking for for um, needs, right? We're not looking for necessary recommendations you think would just come out of needs, but sometimes it mostly just comes out of wants, right? And so one of the recommendations that OPM has is don't don't write requirements for your RFP, write problem statements and invite people to come up with ways to solve the problem, right? So I think that that should be in there is what do we need as a town? What is our problem statement for this area? And then pull recommendations from there. And I just want to think um, in this the process recap, making it a little bit more clear who's making the recommendations. Is the recommendation for the property coming out of council staff? Or is it coming out of TOPE? Or is it coming out of well the TOPE? The, the TOPE will make a the, the TOPE will review and make a recommendation or refer it to the council, but ultimately the council is going to have to make the make the review and recommendation. So the recommendation comes all the way in this beginning step from the TOE committee. And then yeah, what? it's given those recommendations and only really out those recommendations. The public can only comment on those recommendations. Like but my point is at what point do we stop coming up with new things? I, I, I think we are we envision this TOE committee to to never stop. No. So because you know you're always gonna have land and you're always gonna have yeah. So it's always ongoing. Um I guess my point is so we got a property, someone says multi family housing. At what point does that decision get made and it's no longer really feasible for someone else to come in and say, no, we should put a playground there. We should we should build daycare there. It needs to be this. You know what I'm saying? Because what happens is the like it or love it situation right now where you be at four recommendations and that's all you're talking about, those four recommendations, but you're not. Like the, the public can only talk about those four things because that's the four things that got put on the table before they even had a chance to really flush things out. I see your point. And I think that and that that's the frustration, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think that goes into saying how important it is the public's aware of this quarterly yeah. review process. Because if they're not, then you're right, only two get recommended. Public no, they could have put a playground in there. <laughs> so that has to be well recognized as a town, as an important town committee that needs to be publicly open and and to john's point yeah i i didn't i had to leave feeding my kids after they i saw them for 25 minutes before i had to come out here it's not about uh you're asking the public to come to you and most of them don't have the capacity or knowledge that we all need to exist um i recommend in addition to maybe weekends or more accessible times but also going out and moving where you're at right it's it's still a kind of drive for me to get over here if, if you were having something about Pleasant Valley, I would like a big sign at Pleasant Valley saying, hey, we're meeting at this date, at this place, somewhere over in that side of town, right? Like, I agree. You, it doesn't all have to be here. And, and it's easier because these are town rooms and it's easy to book this. But so it sounds like what you're saying is there should be more detail. There should be more detailed process for the TOPE committee. She was also saying she should be more local the meeting could be local to where the issue is there's a practical side of that especially now because we need to to be equipped right so that's, I that's fair and i think that's but a sign, if you put a property, sign system, i i'd like to see in, in these documents I, I think it's maybe the, the actual document you're talking about going on social media and in the newspapers and coming on the town website a physical sign right there that like they do for like zoning changes those are the most informative that I've found for folks to actually know because they're not checking the website. I might not follow your page. You know, I don't yeah. take the paper all like every single day. And those are the details that have to be vetted out in that I'm sorry. in that in that that tote process. No, they're all great points. Yeah, they are great points. 
And those are the points we can't miss. We got to include them in the document. So just model it after what's it take to apply for a liquor license? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> posting. The one been there for what two years, not three years. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> getting back to our point, I don't think technology is a reason not to do a meeting. This is, mm -hmm. technology is all mobile. There's wireless hotspots. Well, you can build mine on the phone. Yeah. Yes, I mean, can. We each other we can't <laughs> hear it off. Yeah. And, and those details as we get through the Pope the, the Tope document, maybe you meet quarterly, but it's on a, on a Saturday morning somewhere in a, in a gymnasium. You know, you can change those details around. Um we're getting into the details. So we're so we're back on Bob's comment on this process recap. And do we think it's a good idea to see if council wants to consider that? I think it's a good idea. So we're not ready. We're not ready for the RFP. Yet. This is, we're, we're using a tool for two completely different things. One is to to pre-vet the a lot, and the other one is to pre-vet an RFP. To I won't say to disconnect them. Yeah. I would connect. So what do we think the benefit of having the tool be formed before we do the RFP process? Then where what's the benefit? Look at look at, look at Claude Chester. Start it out. Start looking at schools. All right. Look at Claude Chester. Look, look at thirty people show up and say we want to. Right next to this other town green we already have. And now I've got work perception design paid by a consultant that I didn't even know was being hired by the town because I guess it fell under the 10 grand threshold. But I've got four ideas for field, and whoever asked and said you really need more field right here, considering West Pleasant Valley. It also starts the process, it gets things moving. Yeah. It's a community go. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. I just want to. Yeah. Well, and you figure you got to go to a 42 member body R RTM that had no say. I mean, that's and that's the thing about the RTM, it's controlled by I don't need this. You're an actual committee member, I don't want to jump over you. I, I think I understand some of that was just communication because part of the it kind of disappeared into the noise. The idea of oh, here's these extra fields. We did a, an expensive and elaborate field study that was pretty clear that we needed more fields. Uh, now, yeah. I, I, it, I find it amazing because. Having grown up in Philadelphia, I never saw so many fields in my life per capita, but I guess that's the normal thing by some kind of measure. We absolutely needed the fields, and what's a great place to put them? But on a floodplain. So I suppose it makes perfect sense in a lot of ways. For practical sense, I don't think it's a great idea to put a pool there just because if you put a pool, dig a pool into a floodplain, if you empty out water out of it, it pops out of the water. It's a boat. So you don't want to do that. You need to have it someplace where you can really anchor it. And there's all these different things that went on, and they actually did go on. It was actually reasonable. I don't know if that was communicated very well. I, well, I, let's I, not I, digress I, on that either. I, <laughs> I, I, stay I think we do need to put in here, though, that unless I've missed it, and I apologize if I have it, is prioritize it. I mean, do we need more fields? Say we do. Is that a priority over a playground in here but doesn't have one or over a community center so question so priorities is this tope going to be considering well we need fields and, and playgrounds but my four acre pleasant valley is supposed to be solving the crisis of 900 units we need to house people but how many acres is claude chester and not a single bit is being considered to be housing which is what every single meeting is slammed down our throats. We need housing. We need housing. We need housing. We need housing. Is the Tope Committee going to be having these conversations? Sure. Yes. That's, I think that's the that reason the Tope Committee is continually meeting. I think that's why it makes sense to start it now. Get these groups talking. Now I'm not the devil because I think I should be housing at Claude Chester. Well, <laughs> but then getting back to this, just from where I come too, you know, we talk about. I'm digressing on the history of areas too. I mean, you don't put book properties not on the HDC, but it saw some of the most significant fighting during the retreat of the Pequot War. You know, uh, Dr. Burroughs' property is highly historically significant. Nobody's brought that up. So, how do we work on protecting that too and giving neighborhoods the parks they need? Which, in, you know, I looked out west for all in urban planning, we have parks and open space in the suburban areas. So, that's you know, so I, I just think, yeah, it, we've got to prioritize it. Too. Well, what is a priority? Well, it might also, are our fields a priority? Do we have enough right now or something else is a priority? I don't I don't know. Right. It might also be that, you know, a recommendation comes forward and, you know, there might be something that the town is like every so many housing, you know, per square, you know, housing lots that there should be a park. 
I mean, I know some towns in different states where when they put a development in, they have to designate a small piece of open space and it should be some type of like playground for that little community or that area. No, we have that on it. Yeah, but like my neighborhood doesn't have a park. Well, but that's kind of after the fact. Right, right. But but there should be some but there should be some grandfather. I mean, kids shouldn't have to travel so far. There should be some connectability. So there is a need to that communication's not maybe it's talking behind the scenes, but it's not out to the forward public. And that's what the Tope Committee should yeah. hopefully yeah. solve. Right. Okay, moving on. Go moving on. To Moving on. Going to the term of prioritization, I think the tow would be that would like to Absolutely. Be factor would be that they be the one something up with what we believe is priority would be. And so Bob, we're we're, report, so. we're on slide eleven. Yeah, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make some changes to slide eleven to move forward with a recommendation to the council on establishment of the TOPE committee. Okay. Everybody good with that? And then I think we're all set with the slideshow. Anyone else? Well, you want to see the uh, the new property breakout? Oh, that's the three, the three. Um... Yeah, just give me a second here. Yep. There. Well, we have it. Page page twelve and thirteen. Okay. Yeah. All right, you got it. Yeah. Slide twelve and thirteen. So these are going to be not really discussed in the presentation. So you could make it be three pages. So that way they, the, the reader can actually read it. Okay. You know what I mean? The, on, on the left side of page 12, make that page 12. And then the right side of page 12, make that 13. And then 13 be 14. That way it's larger and readable. And the the, the PowerPoint person presenting isn't going to talk about it. It's just going to be there for, for uh, reference. Okay. Larry, Larry, you got that? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> now should is this sorted in any particular way should it be sorted by size or it is sorted size? by size oh it is okay oh yeah okay i i just had a quick question um in old mystic that town green that's owned by the town that at one point the town didn't know we owned it that make it on the list uh yeah i thought i sent that to you oh you uh, may have ago. Okay. yeah yeah, I don't see it on the list here. That's why I'm asking. Well, it, because it's not unused per se. It's, it's very small. I think it's like point, point 0.1 or something like that. Yeah, but it's an in, not something you talk about. It's an interesting piece of property because it's town owned, but the electricity on it's not paid for by the town. Yeah, yeah I, I thought we listed that. I think it's listed as used, not unused, but. Okay. Okay, so that will be make that a little more readable and then I think that PowerPoint's good. Okay. So Bob, let me know when you want to regroup on that. Uh uh whenever you got time. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. You're the one okay, with five so kids. I'm retired. <laughs> good for you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're on to the next, which is we're gonna send uh, it back this to is, you. Okay, sounds good. So now we're going to go through, and Larry, we're going to kick this off to you. You put this together. Uh, do you want to elaborate on how you came up with the, the summary table of contents? Yeah, my thought was that there was so much text in the handouts, you know, the nine uh, exhibits, if you will. So I said, well, all right, let me go through and identify content. Uh, so I thought if we could agree upon content, that would be the step one. And then we could talk about the details of the text within there. So I, I went through them all and I didn't exclude anything. So this would be kind of like, now maybe there's something there that somebody wants to add, but but this was the result of review of all those documents. So it, it breaks down. Um, I think I started with the, uh, the Massachusetts one. And then added other things from you know all the other documents. So if you go through the, uh, I think was that was handed out right. So if you go through the table of contents piece, um, you'll notice there's you know seven major categories, and then subsets underneath that. So I and then there's an attachment with a bunch of details. Uh, now in there there is uh, information about 
you know, qualifications of the development team, which gets to the point that's brought up about who's done a, you know, a research on the, uh, the developer. Well, but regardless is, I thought this was a place to start and to go through the table of contents and say, <laughs> excuse me, you know, agree, disagree, or there's something missing. Yeah, I, I reviewed this. I like this as a great uh, starting point. I'm not sure if anyone else has any comments on, <laughs> on where we go from here. Um, actually, Councillor Westervelt's hand is up. So uh, if I could just flag over to him. Councillor you know Westervelt? Probably got yes, sir. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, you I did, yeah, I'm doing all right. I actually had my hand up on my phone to find out if you could actually hear me because I was not there as a panelist and my phone's still connected and so is this. So. I'm good. I don't have any questions right now, but okay. I do agree Great. that we should move forward on the tote. Okay, thank you. All right, so so back to you, Larry. So thoughts on next steps? I mean, this is going to be a lengthy process, so I don't know if anyone has any recommendations. Do you want to give comments, review um, piece by piece? What do you have any thoughts, Larry? Because really, we're going to regurgitate a lot of this detail and insert it yeah. into this document. Well, yeah, you know, before we get to the detail, I thought it'd be appropriate to say, do we agree upon the contents? of what an RFP uh, process or approach or document would have um, and go through it that way. Um, I mean, some of these are pretty basic stuff. I mean, you know, the project notice uh, has you know, some pretty specific items in there. So it'd be anything missing, anything extraneous we should strike. Um, and then if we do that, then it gets down to, you know, what do we beg, borrow, steal to plug in to these sections? And maybe we divide that up among the, the TOPE members to each take a, you know, a, you know, section one through six and, or seven and take a whack at it. I don't know. That, so that, that'd be, I think, the place to start. Otherwise, we could spin our wheels for a long time on details when, you know, we don't have an agreement on the overall concept here. <clears throat> Right, so why doesn't everyone take a, take a few minutes now and just look at the, the contents and see if you have any thoughts? In, in looking at these, should we come up with, for instance, what the town council wants to get out of each one of these? What, what are their requirements? You know, for uh, particularly, you know, municipal process or uh, what any of these. What what, are, what is the town council's requirements uh, so that they feel comfortable with it? Not, not that we, not that we know what those requirements are right now. Yeah, I don't know if we want to. I don't know if we want to go in that direction because I think what we're trying to do is put together an independent review of what the RFP process framework should, should be. Right, should be. Yeah. Should be, and if they if they have changes that they want to personally make changes to, they they can you know they can recommend that. But I think I, I think I'd prefer to go the road of we do what we think is right based upon our review and so forth. The, the other thing is is we have to remember that it, the council is an elected body every two years, and so what we decide now, and one of the things that we we, we govern on currently are from other previous bodies. We don't go back and change and wipe out everything. So the hope is that this council as a collaborative body heard from the community and that we are going to look at ways to what's the best interest of the whole community, because in another term, we don't know who will be elected. So the decisions I'm making aren't my own personal things. It's what I heard from the community. So if we keep that as our driving force, I'm just concerned that we don't really want to, it shouldn't be catered to this council or the next council. It really should be brought in as a whole. Lauren? Yeah. So I just I have a question. Is this um, the table of contents? Is this for an RFP document that you're going to stick out to yes. potential developers? This isn't a policy. And my question is, is the TOPE going to be developing an RFP policy? Because the RFP document itself is the middle step, right? So you have all of this is what I know from what I do. RFP is step two. What you what you stick out into the world is step two. What comes first? is all of that information and valuation. So that's good, we got that, we discussed that. RFP that you kick out into the world is step two, but then there's more steps after that, which need to have a policy governing uh, 
what people are supposed to do, what they have to do by law or statute. Um, and so I just, I don't think, I don't want that to get lost in them. I just think that like the, what happens once you start getting the information back in. Yeah, I think that's, Correct if I'm wrong, Larry, but I understood that as you that was one through five is what she's referring to as the, the I guess the document, and then six is the reviewing and the evaluation of is that consider what you're referring to as the policy or the review? So when I so if I I I respond to RFPs to my job, right? That's what I do for a job. And then with the state contracting standards board, I audit what agencies do when they kick an RFP out the door and evaluate a contractor. So I kind of see it from both ends. If I was a developer or someone trying to respond to this and you gave me a document that had all of your policy in it, it'd be a pain in the ass for me to go through because I'm not looking at that. I want to know like uh was this already approved for sale? Who has to approve it after you agree to my project? Like those kind of things. That's what I assume the municipal process would be if that's what you're talking about with policy. I wouldn't think that what you have to do as a town council and staff has to do, which is like receive the sealed bid, uh, put out a time frame to receive questions, make the questions and responses public, give offers a chance, you know, like that's policy. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And, and I like her point because I'm thinking of a, you know, without getting into specifics, a recent RFP that fell apart where the developer actually said that, well, I thought you guys were supposed to do that. That wasn't so, clear, I mean, supposedly. I mean, I'm just, you know, taking your comments. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think yeah. Martin's points are very good on. Would it would it be appropriate? Once again, I don't want to speak out of turn or out of line in the sense, um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of somebody. But you know, I don't know if this is off here. Wanted to present a small slide, shall we add her to our our agenda, and allow her to show, like, you know, just make up the name of a company, like show us mm -hmm. some documents of how that process and what you know, beginning, middle, and end, you know, just to kind of see. From a state level, you know, she maybe can just do a five or ten minute PowerPoint. I don't know. If, if you go to the, um, I don't know if I can share this on my Zoom, but there's, a, if we're just talking about the RFP document, kick out the door. The state has this whole PowerPoint presentation about drafting results based RFPs that gets into, and it's, it's a recorded presentation, so you can listen to the actual dialogue from the procurement policy director. And they have um, amazing information like mm -hmm. ready to go now this is more specific so opm does uh, personal services they don't do like real estate transactions which is what you guys are talking about but it's the same exact concept um Could you send that to us in the i sent this to you yeah. i don't think i sent a direct like pdf link but it's in the website link if you pull down okay. um so it's it's in here and has this also what exactly we're asking for this breakdown of um uh, pretty much of how it goes. Trying to do the same thing. But anyways, if you go through here, it'll it'll answer that question of you know what what a business would want to be looking at or what you would want to create to give to business to look at. And and that's um that's really something like I said that's step two or three. So what Larry's put together is the actual RFP, RFP document. Sure. So there's, what, there's templates for that too, so you guys don't have to. Well, I think that's what he's he's kind of regurgitated all the various pieces of information. So I guess what we need to do now then is discuss another segment of this, which would be a, the policy that's going to surround the review of the. I think I think that's going to be more of your work is, and you want to have your policy in place beforehand because what's going to happen is. I'm going to go to you and say, hey, I want to put 13 apartment units up uh, in Baquanic Bridge, right? And then uh, you're going to say, okay, we're going to start talking, but um, but then you're going to say, oh, you need you need planning and zoning approval. Well, why didn't you tell me that in the RFP process? Because what I have to deliver to you is a schedule, right, of how long it takes me to put up these 13 apartment buildings. Part of that schedule is going to be cost of getting permits, getting consultants, doing surveys. And if that information is not put up front, like from your policy, so I mean, what I'm saying is you don't want to write your entire policy into the RFP, but you want to have that bullet line of you need to get X, Y, Z approvals before, you know, this. And we're looking for this timeline. So would the TOPE committee be like in that policy of numbers, possibly? I, I think the TOPE 
committee meets to develop. What I'm saying is you have to have a policy before you kick an RFP out the door because of getting into it even more, there's going to be bidders questions, right? So you're going to get three. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of like going all over the place. Uh, let's let's invent this this fake thing. Uh, ABC construction. Yeah, A, B, A construction, B construction, C construction. They're all going to bid on Clodchester to build you splash pads and fuel, right? They're all going to have questions about the RFP before they even give you their ideas. They're going to go, well, um, how much of this is wetlands? What's the town's rules on this? Uh, are, are there height restrictions on how big of a, you know, flagpole I can put here? They're going to ask a bunch of questions. How many children do you have in this district? How many, what's your, what's your population growth? Those are bidders questions and you have to decide, they need to know how you're going to respond to those because one of the biggest things that we as a city contract with their court kick people up on is that they're giving different information to different bidders. And then you've created an unequal competitive field because one person has more information than the other. One of the big things they ask us, is there grant money available? What's the town subsidies like? And if I ask that, but they don't ask that, I have more information now. I'm going to change what my bid looks like. I'm going to look like I'm coming in a million dollars under because what's not getting reflected is that I know there's money out there I can take. Aren't you required to send all that information to all the same? You are. Absolutely. Yeah. You are. yeah. I mean, that, that was sections three and four, you know, getting into the site limitations and zoning restrictions architecture restrictions i mean all that stuff is is i mean i, I agree but i don't know if i frame that as the philosophies i frame that is specifics because different parcels are going to have different uh encumbrances and different restrictions so i you know i don't know how to make that generic other than saying we need to identify those specifics in every RFP we go out. And yeah, it's got I think to that part of the trick is you, you, you might miss something. I think it's your, what you've got, Larry, in your D and E thing on the RFP project notice, in fact, is that that's, that's the only place you actually covered it when you have questions and addenda. Right. And part of that is just to lay out the fact that you can ask all the questions you like. We're not answering them except in writing to everybody. So typically that's that's the whole thing is that your RFP is due April 1st questions are due to the town April 14th responses will go out to bidders April 20th clarification meetings can get set up in the last week and then your RFP is due to me May 30th that's a timeline and a schedule that you need to put into your RFP that's required pretty so, much that's so, going to be expected but you need also have a policy of yeah how are we going to so do we currently have anything we like that i guess i, I defer to bob i mean from the how is the housing authority when you guys did it on property i mean does that process at all take place here you talking to me yeah with the rfps uh no uh well if the town owns property and they yep. want to that they want to develop into housing, they would go out with an RFP and the housing authority would respond to it. Okay. If it's property we own, we own it. We're, we're not. So Bob, are you saying that you're never asked to, um, you never ask any questions on an RFP, you just develop a response? Yeah, we do. Them? Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. It's just back and forth email with the town. There's no, uh, you don't get to know what other bidders ask what the answers are um I, I can't hear what it, you're saying it, was there a process to make sure you got to know what everybody else's questions were and what those answers were for, for the oral school did you have were there any other questions yeah and, he also was putting a no uh gardens didn't he want the garden wasn't it the gardens as well the the mystic uh knowing school as well and yeah but whatever the, whatever the case was uh you well start yeah, we, never got, we never got the first base on the uh, oh the mystic girl school yeah yeah so just to summarize here i think make sure i'm understanding larry's put together this document of table of the rfp document itself but you're what you're recommending is a policy as well a lot of it's going to be covered in here from from what i'm hearing i think 
Or what if we kept it in here and had numbers eight be a policy, the po Pardon. general policy? Okay. So obviously, if you had that schedule like questions, responses, that, that's all public record too, right? And it sounds like this is kind of something we can get pre cans from the state. I, I mean, I, I'm happy to put something together. Um, what I'm saying is, I think we've gone through like a lot of examples of the, the policy document and the RFP document. Um, they're two different products, right? Because they have two different functions. One, one is your rules, right? And one is one is what you're kicking out the door. And so you want your rules to be fair, firm, and consistent for everybody. It's not going to change RFP to RFP. Whereas your RFP is going to change. Or it's almost like your bylaws or governing body of yeah, how okay. you govern your it process. Is. Once you're you know, right, everything has it. Little League has it. You know, this has it. I think Town Council has it. We have a we we have a charter, right? We we have a charter that we governs how we operate, but we have a bunch of other sub rules that change based on what we're dealing with. But the charter is like the umbrella, the top or the, the top of the. For, it, for my comfort as a bidder, right, to know how, to know the rules of the game, right, sure. to, to know how, what's my complaint process if I think that you, you told somebody else that there's 10 grand in a grant somewhere, but you didn't tell me that. What's my, you know, like. So do we know if a town has that already? I don't think I've looked for that. that. What is their governing? Important question to ask. So what would that, would that document be? I assume that the town of Groton has a procurement policy. You would hope to God that they, they do probably that. do in the, in the in the ordinances or the charter somewhere. It's it's embedded yeah. in there. Are you going to reach out for yeah, that? Is it in the yeah. charter? And is it being done at two different things? And is it something it's, we it's need to be in the charter? Memorialize. If it's in the if it's in like the town code, I also don't really see that there aside from it saying like you have to give so many days for an R like you have to have thirty days for an R P minimum. But it's not going to tell you uh, how to handle communications between the town and a bidder. That's there's, the policy, right? There's there's a section in the charter on purchasing, I believe. Yeah, but I, I see Warren's point where I think I think it would behoove everybody in a very important role of this committee of the to to come up with this policy. I I mean personally, again, wearing the hat of as a citizen, or once I decide I want to be a developer someday, I'm just saying that as a joke. I want to know the rules going in. I want to know Warren's built 30 apartments here, her company, but it's my first time. I want to be have the same shot as she does. And I think that policy is very, I think it's important. I think it's going to give both the bidder and the public and our town staff. It's it's it's, it's the rules for like the dope, I mean, the dope's gonna change from the time right. as people come and go into the committee and you know. All right, so let's cut to the chase. How about this for a suggestion? You'd be willing to put together some type of policy for this committee to review? Yeah. That would be, I mean, you, you kind of said you would, that's why. I, 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 I sounds like you have the expertise and knowledge, and we'd be willing to, I mean, if everybody agrees, that would probably be, I, I mean, if I try to put something together, it's not going to compare where you can put it together. So agree. I love it, but, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. great. You've done it for a couple of state agencies, so. That would be great. I mean, everybody agree that would be a, a way to move forward with this. And, and in the meantime, is someone going to ask what Groton currently yeah. has? Just to make, you know, we don't want to. Rule out that it doesn't exist. Yeah. That's why I was referring to Bob. Yeah, who dealt with let's, you know. Let's be, let's be careful here. The the RFP uh, process that was sent out, I think the very first document, not in the last nine, was a procurement process. This isn't a procurement RFP. So he, there's different kinds of RFPs. So uh, that is entirely different and has different rules. So we're talking about land use, which is you know, a, a fairly unique set of questions that need to be included in the policy. So I think, you know, I agree with all that, but I don't want to confuse it with the fact that I'm going to buy, you know, six pallets of nails. Um, you know, two sure. different two different animals, right? Agreed. I don't, I don't do that kind of service. <laughs> Any services, but... All right, no, that was good. Good discussion on that. Thanks. And with that in mind, keep in mind because you were also talking about the needs base as opposed to what you want. I'll do a little aside here is that one of my great things to get to do with senior officers at sub base was they come to say, "Here's what I want," and I'd say, "I I, I don't need to give you what you want. <laughs> I need to give you what you need." Big difference, and that's a big difference. And 
you don't necessarily know what you need. Just tell me what you, what you what, what's good. Just tell me what you need mm -hmm. and base it up. Like I need to, you know, or and they'll even come up with something. Well, I need to be able to get to my boats in one minute. No, you don't. What do you actually need? need. Yep. And you get, have to get down to the needs. For land use, it's a mix of the two. Because very often it's not, okay, maybe we don't need somehow an extra thing, but we've already agreed that this is what we want. So it's a blend. Well, I think in back to needs is we don't need to do anything with all this property right away. Either. There's nothing wrong with land banking some of it for the future. The whole, you can get into what you actually need and right. go down to really. Yeah, we don't, well. let's not digress into that topic. Bob, Bob, do you have something to say? Your yeah, hand is yeah, up? Yeah. Uh, could you summarize the uh, policy discussion in the notes in the minutes? I, I, I couldn't yes, hear I mean, everything it, everyone was saying. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll summarize them briefly. Uh, Lauren's going to work on a policy document for us to review. <laughs> and that's good. It's somewhat separate and distinct from what Larry has put together. It's, it's, it's more of a reactive to questions and answers after the RFP process has been distributed. But we'll we'll include that in the minutes. And that's why I was wondering, and, and also that we want to find out is there already a policy that Groton has? Is, is someone going to reach out to see? I have that on my list. Okay, okay. But um, I think, like somebody mentioned, I think it's a, just a procurement policy that it's not going to be land use based. It's okay. just how they purchase things and the rules you have to follow. Oh, I, I I missed I missed the beginning. It's a policy for what procurement. So it's a general procurement policy most municipalities oh. have. Okay. Just on how you got to go to three bids, and you know, over twenty thousand, you have to get so many bids, and it's, well, well, that, it's, that's that you got to be careful there, guys, because you know, on certain properties, you, get, you only may get one bid. Uh, so some of those requirements aren't necessarily relevant to land use, right? No, I was just saying that's usually how procurement policies are. Not well, I, no, I agree. Them. That's why I was trying to make the different distinction, because you know. <laughs> You know, you only have a. You, know, you may not get three folks that meet the. Now you could say, then we're not going to do anything. I mean, that's fair. Well, but I'm, you know, I, I think we just got to think about that as uh, you know. Once we see, you know, what the policy statements are. Um, also, we want to be careful too, because if if we where's it? You know, does the town jump if they only get one bid and they just take that one? Like, it, what is our policy? I mean. Oh, if it, yeah, it's you don't, land, yeah, you don't have to, but you don't want to exclude it either, right? We don't know what the town's currently doing, right? That's information that's never coming to me to the council, really. But I just get, I just get the follow state law. I, I don't know what the rules. All, all I know is that when it comes to the council, they say, "Here's your preferred developer." We go in executive session. We talk about what's going to go on, and it's going to wetlands and planning and zoning or whatever. That's all we hear. And then all the work is done behind the scenes and it's presented in a package back to us again. So, well, that's where we're hoping to change that process. So, so that's this is, where this, you is, know, this is policy for town council behavior. <laughs> right? Town council actions. What does the town council do when Portia, what you just said, you're in the, you're in executive session and what's allowed, right. what's not allowed? Right. Well, you know, it's it's important to know as a counselor where we stand because at that per, that moment. We can't talk to anybody else about it. So right. where's our policy up front that says we only have one bidder? And it may be the most amazing bidder. It may not be. But where do we have a like to stand that said like to give it more time? And I want to see one more bid come in at this time, you know, or does the town have the power to just push forward with that one bid and, and say, this is great. We finally got one. Let's develop land. I don't know. It, it's That's a weird. lot of gray areas as a council. Oh, one, one of the things that comes out of the evaluation was that among the things that would be in there be what would make it unacceptable. So you can go through it. We only got the one bidder, and it's not exactly what we want, but it's all that we got. If it's if it's in there that says here's what would not be acceptable, then we just go back to the drawing board and say, well, that didn't work. Thanks for coming, and we'll just try try something else. But what's and, and so it might be there's a lot of things that are unacceptable, right? Like I eat a lot of organic fruits and vegetables because I find non unacceptable, but others might say they'll have them. It's not that I won't eat organic, but I I I'm picky about my berries and my other things. So determining that term, it might be unacceptable from 
the water or the watershed or zoning. Um, but what about when it's unacceptable to the community? Well, we'd have to, that would be one that, that would have to delineate what would be unacceptable right. to the community. You can't delineate it, nobody can build it. Right. And, and if it overwhelmingly a community does not support a project and taxpayers do not want this thing here, where does the community have a say? But it passes zoning, it passes wetlands, it passes all this other stuff. But, but the, what it is is the size and the metrosity is just not something the community wants in that area. Where is that? that chance to. And the other part that I've heard overwhelmingly is making sure in these, like the rule thing that you're talking about and also the agreement, that we are making sure that our attorneys are putting stop sections in there that are protecting us long-term. So when it's deemed that it's not fit, let it be community, environmentally, or whatever, we're not digging ourselves out from the behind the scenes. And that's where I need help. You know, uh, my expertise are not there. We do not have enough protections in there. And then it said, well, we'll, if, we'll wait for planning and zoning to deem it unfit. And then once they do, it all falls on them. That's not fair. It should already be determined ahead of that. So I, I just don't know where we, we write that in either. So that's something that can be covered. Um, the, the concern about the single bidder and what do you do? And then the concern about non responsiveness. So um, those are both things. So what I see in uh, solicitations are a very clear line that says, just because you respond doesn't mean I have to do anything with it. Just because you respond, you have no right to receiving a board. Uh, and that's especially true in sole source solicitations, where you're only, you're, I'm going to, because I know you can do it, let me see what you have, but just because you respond to me doesn't mean I'm going to give you anything. So that says right up front, I don't have to give you anything. Right, just because even if we get four bidders and all amazing and you're all responsive, yeah, we still might not want to do anything. So that's that's a protection right up front. Um, be careful about your pro forma contract that you send out and start negotiating before you get everyone's approval. That's a that's a lesson learned, I hope. Um, and then as far as non-responsiveness goes, that can cut two ways. So if you have three bidders and they all respond, um, and the one that you like the most didn't send in a document that is a required document, you don't get to take them. And so you can choose to go back out to bid and start the process over again, which takes time. It's gonna piss off developers. It's gonna you know, bother people. You might introduce new things in the process you didn't want to, um, but you have to do that because otherwise you're not being fair to the other respondents. And, and then that's the other gray area when it comes to the council. Once it's determined and it's non classified anymore, so to speak, I don't really get to see those documents. So I don't know that why did Broughton Housing Authority get picked? Why did Restler? Like, so there could be a process because in other towns, once the final five bidders are determined and, oh, Johnny, the, you know, Johnny Construction forgot this document. So we have to throw him out. And now we're down to four and we consider this one. The preferred developer there's got to be some way that the council is involved because if everyone's going to put the blame on the council in the end planning and zoning said yep go and council said yes i think this is a great development i need some protection as a counselor just like in anything i do as to know how were they determined to be the preferred but almost sounds like we need companies of the council here's the five Here's five contracts, you know what we're looking at, and then here's the final bid. Why? Well, what, what is the procedure? Because we're kind of up with, though, here's what the TOP will do. Here's the town wide procedure for how we're going to do this. What you're hitting on is something else, which was then it goes to the council for you to decide, yeah. which is this other thing about a process for deciding, which I don't think we're actually doing here, but maybe we need to. What is the process? The town council would be, which would also protect you, which would instead protect the council and say, hey, here's what we use to decide. Here's the information we had. Here's the mechanism we use for deciding. It fit. And we said yes, or we said no, based on that. Right. Well, but, I think that's what the TOPE process is going to do is give all the recommendations and the pros and cons to the council. They can't make the decision. The council has to make the decision. But if all the detail, if all the proposal, all the detail things are going to the council, it's out in the public. It's transparent. It's right. that's what we're all trying to get right. 
Well, I mean, there, I there comes a point that it's not public, right? Because, you know, you like if I'm going to buy a house and we're all bidding on it, I don't even know that you're even one of the ones that are bidding. <laughs> because if not, we could talk and say, well, if you don't have this much money, then stop bidding up because you're bidding me up and you're outbidding me. <laughs> so I want to buy this house for cheaper. So if you don't have any more money, stop. You know, there's a reason why we don't talk because you that's selling is going to lose money. It's not fair. So there is a process where it is has to be. I do understand it has to be somewhat confidential. But if we can go in executive session to discuss the preferred, how come the council's not brought in to discuss the top three? Well, and, that's what and we should. That's because what... we are in executive session and we're supposed to say we're not going to discuss it. No, but I think that's what this process is going to allude to is we're going to bring in all of the bids. The TOPE's going to be part of the review process and the council is going to see all of the information. I mean, that's the way I'm envisioning it. And that's what I'm wondering to other towns. Does New London do that? Does Waterford, like, it shouldn't be just, and it's no insult to our town staff, it shouldn't be just their decision at the end. And at the end, I said, well, the council gave us a direction to move forward with the preferred developer. Well, that's all you gave me. <laughs> so um, to answer your question of when does the council get brought in, um, something that you will have to include both in your policy and your RFP document is the selection criteria and the selection process. Right. Right? Yes. And so well, other so places, um, other towns, what they may choose to do is have, and what I've seen is you have a selection committee. And it's made up of a few of a few members, and they go response by response by response, and they have a set list of things they're checking off. Did you give me all the documents? On a scale of one to ten, do I like your idea? Does it make sense? Um, is how much does it cost? Is that a reasonable amount? And everyone has the same criteria. They're judging one to ten, and that's all kept as part of your documentation record. That's FOIable, at least on a state level. That's and that's example. and that's part of what he has is number six in here. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's super important. And that's I think addressing counselor Porto on the concern. That committee should have a counselor or two on it. I believe making... I like with the Mr. Goral school, there were two counselors, but again, they didn't talk about any of the other developers. We only heard about the preferred. Well, that's so so having two counselors make a decision of a body of nine. So that was that was not a correct process because you right. didn't see all of the solicitations. And then right. was I able to see your scoring? If I FOI that meeting, did I do I get to see the scoring sheets? Do I get to know how counselor B and counselor D they scored these right. developers? And why are why are we jacking this score up when it's very obvious that all four other people on the committee gave them zeros? Why is this one person giving them a 10? You know, those are things that I look at as an auditor. Right. What's going on here? It's very obvious they were correct here. And this guy over here is not correct. Why is he getting so many? Score. And it can't so, be just so Lauren, that's what I was gonna ask. Is there a less on so I agree on but on the scoring sheet can it so I'm gonna use your own school just as an example that it's come up, you know. Some of these scoring sheets were just that where it's like somebody just gave a 10 or everybody else gave a four, and you kind of scratch your head going, why? So is there a way to keep that scoring sheet less subjective? Less subjective? Yeah, where I like it because you can have you know, I might think it's a great idea to have a hot dog stand somewhere. You might say, Well, I like salad, so I don't like hot dogs. You know, it's subjective, it doesn't and then, I mean, that's that's hard with, with grading it, but the idea is that um, you have enough like evidence between what you asked for and what was given, and then you can put a score there. Just typically, you, you add it up that whoever gets the most points wins, but you have notes written, right? So someone can justify, I gave them a four because, whereas everyone else gave them a 10. And then that way, that one person who had a very serious concern that might not have been taken as seriously, at least has them on record now. Right. This is why I didn't think. And then when it gets shoved through and it comes back, oh hey, they got convicted of public bribery, and that's why I didn't think that that was so great. It's now on record on this paper. So no, I told you. So and before, like you know, and just speaking in past development, you know, you have two counselors that went, and they're scoring these sheets. But me and Nick, Council McBride think he's a great person. Can have a great conversation with him. There's things we vote differently on. There's a lot of things we vote alike on. But if he's on that committee and I'm not, and he's on there with another counselor B or C, they're vetting the whole thing. We're all nine individually elected people with representing different interests. So to only have two people on there doing the scoring is not representative of the whole body. So that's the other part where is it going to be functional when it gets down to the top three? So should the so should the committee vet the top five and when we get down to the top three, the council comes in and then scores all nine members with this group? But having two counselors who randomly have their own interests that don't live on that side of town scoring, 
it just it doesn't it doesn't well, why can't up. you have all the council right you know, when i'm in, when i'm in new london we have the councils in on every right and, and here it's not them i'll tell you right now i was not part of the scoring sheet for mystic oral school i wasn't part of and any you, of the probably shouldn't just be counselors who are scoring those uh you're gonna want someone who oh there's other people on that committee i'm not sure who's it all in there but it's i'm sure but it gives what your point is you now as a counselor have more information than counselor mcbride did right all right. it knows about the preferred developer correct yeah and then if there's a fraction or there's the you know <laughs> Whatever it count, whatever, then you're you're got the preferred developer in front of you, and everyone's saying this is great, and the town staff are saying this is wonderful, and everyone's saying don't disrespect their their proposal. They did the vetting and all this work. How dare you shoot this down? I don't know anything about it. Well, and, and that, that so getting to that point, and again, just very high level here. <laughs> you know, on one project that we talked about, you know, one of the counselors on the scoring board like this development because they do it in Austin. I think was the exact town he compared it to. Well, to me, we're not Austin, so I don't really care. Right. So, you know, again, how does that whole council get that? Because, you know, and I'm for sure for you guys, like I sit on a committee, right? And I may have my personal feelings about it, something that's coming up, but before the meeting, I do the research, I pull the plans, I walk the property because my feelings shouldn't matter. And I try not to make them matter. It's about the facts. So, how do we make sure the election committee? sticks to the facts rather than the field and everyone was elected up here by a lot of different people and so that 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 diversity of opinion should be part of the selection if the submission requirements of what we're asking of the respondents is tight enough it should be able to be rated objectively on any each one of those statements you need you to do this you do this. And it should be tight so the looser it is, then the more haphazard it gets. You should be able to have it fairly tight, even if it's not exactly what you want, but you should be able to have to, have to be able to define it so they can respond. One thing always, when people always ask me about, you know, give me some information on how I respond to this RFP, and the answer, number one, I mean, in general, you have to answer the mail, you have to go line by line on it and make sure you filled out each thing on there that you're told you're going to be rated on. And those things need to be very tight, which by the time it's scored, maybe it could go to the whole, to however many people it is. You don't, shouldn't end up with wide variations. If, if they are, then it wasn't written very well. Mm. Because it should be this wide thing about what would be cool. You know, there's, there's nothing like that in there. It's, I need this much of this. I need this done there. I need this to be taken care of. And line by line, you get number score for each one of those things you fulfilled, better, worse, otherwise. I'm so going to Bob. He's got it. I'm oh, sorry. Better finish. So, so by the time it gets to full council, yeah, there shouldn't be much to argue over. It should be a matter of gradient, perhaps. But a whole bunch. If, if in fact there are ten respondents, eight of them will have dropped right off because there's no way everybody's that good, and, and you will have the record of why each one. Whether or not it's a small board or it's everybody in the council, whatever it was, it's the writing of it that needs to be tight. Bob, your hands raised. Yeah, just uh, uh, for what it's worth, uh, I very much like Larry's outline, particularly uh, section four. And if uh, Lauren is going to do a policy, uh, could I ask, and I think we've talked about it a little bit tonight, is the subject of uh, secrecy in the RFP process, such that when when, and why is secrecy justified? So, uh, Portia, you're in the executive uh, session and you hear things, you can't talk about it and everything. So, okay, that's good. So, why, when and why is that justified? And when secrecy is justified, when is it no longer justified? So that we can now involve the public, uh, and and what can the public know out of all of this? Mm. Okay, so, so it's a, in general, it's the subject of secrecy. Okay, the, the state has statutes regarding that, um, you know, uh, covering confidentiality of information, and a lot of that, uh, you know, happens to protect 
the bidders themselves, you know, their their business interests, but also to protect them from their competitors, right? Um, and usually what I've seen is that that information becomes public after a preferred developer has been chosen. Right. And and there's really there's not a lot of good ways to, to make it more public outside of that um, without compromising um or scaring off developers. I mean if they think that if you request and you should be requesting uh, financial capability on these they're going to send you a bunch of financial statements about their business and they don't want that public because that might impact whatever. Um, and that's that's fine. I think that's a very valid thing to say and to include in your in your RFP document is this is the level of confidentiality that we will give to you as a respondent. Um, now, once once someone's no longer a bidder, like a, a considered a bit a bidder, um, you could I, I don't know what the FOI rules are specifically. They could be part of the record. Um, they could not be. I mean, I don't I don't really know. Um, I'd have to dig into the state statutes about that a little bit more. But that's that's where the nine counselors or at least nine more involved early on is going to be key because then they're hearing all that. It's not just two counselors doing a scoring with however many other people, but also it's important that um, we do not select a preferred, preferred developer before establishing that the land is suitable for the development that we consider preferred to an extent. And now it might not be 100% vetted, but we should have done those checks and balances and, and that's where those RFPs of like, I want to build an ice cream shop in a small zoo with a petting. Like, before I send that out, there's got to be some collaboration saying that this ice cream shop and petting zoo can fit in the zoning here. Then we send out the RFP and then the, the preferred developers come back and we say, okay, here's the top three. The council does their scoring with it, whoever else is part of this group and we submit it. And now we got our preferred developer, but we already know that they should not have much trouble going through planning and zoning and wetland because we already so that's talked the toll about process. That. Yeah, toll process should right. solve that issue. And, and that it shouldn't be that we get a preferred developer and then we decide, oh, no plan. It's too late. We've done so much work, so much money. Sometimes the town has invested money, and that's where the community seems to get very upset. And I think there's a way, not to say there's going to be a hiccup and that will be fully defined, but it should be pretty well assume that there's nothing that we see that's outlined before we move forward. They don't have to know who the preferred developer is. They just need to know that it might be an ice cream shop in a zoo and how many stories and how whatever else. They don't need to know the name. They don't need to know their financials. But we should have that as a town from our town staff communicating with planning and zoning to make sure what their vision is actually can go. And that, that would solve a lot of the problems. So I'm not sure how that all looks. And how is the council involvement, but two counselors randomly and several other people scoring with you know other people in, invested and then getting a preferred developer on a piece of land that has not even been zoned for that. Um, we also, for planning on a zone change, people have reached out to me, and that should be in the wording that there's a protection in there. If the zone change doesn't go through, we're not hanging from the rafters here. That's a risk that the developer should be willing to take, but it shouldn't fall in the back of the town. Yes, if you'd like to proceed forward and you want to request a zone change, if it doesn't go through, then we walk away clean. That, that, that's got to be defined. And, and I don't see that in any of our, our writings. Well, the whole process should, should take care of it. Right. And I'm not sure at what point, too, do we also need to consult our attorneys who are writing our RFPs and with the yeah. town. So I, I have another feeling on that that's probably too early to bring up. I, I'm wondering if we is probably going to be like not a very popular opinion. I don't know if the attorney that has to defend us actually write the RFP or if we should bring a separate attorney in to write RFPs. Maybe an attorney to write your RFP. I don't know if they write them, but they put the legal language in there to make sure that we're protected at the end. Uh, yeah, that, that should be boilerplate stuff. Yeah. Like I mentioned yeah. the, okay. the, like, the held harmless stuff, the uh, we yeah. don't owe you anything stuff. That, yeah. that should be boilerplate at all. Because yeah, you, I, you get that point. as a taxpayer, I will say on the record, Amy Harper, that we paid a legal firm money to write an RFP and then had to pay them to defend us on the 
RFP that was probably poorly written, in my opinion. Let's not digress in the past. <laughs> Moving on. So it's getting to be two hours. So let's try to wrap this up. Um, we have some changes to the PowerPoint. Bob and I will work on. Lauren, you're going to work on that policy. When do you want um, that? Well, hopefully by the Friday prior to the, our next meeting, because that way I can distribute to everybody. First and third Wednesday. Seven. Yeah, if that's sort of false. And then, Larry, let's get back just to quickly summarize how you'd like to proceed with your piece, because I'd like to keep this moving along as well. Do you, do you think it would be a good idea to split this up between committee members to take a stab at e you know, each piece? Do you have well, any thoughts? I think, yeah, I think, it, you know, start point is, is the content first. I mean, I already made a change. It says, you know, 1.0A should be proposal major milestone schedules, not just, you know, the proposal distribution date or, re or response date. Um, you know, are there things, I think as a group, are there things missing should be deleted or should be added. And it, once we get through that, then I would suggest that we divide it up and have you know a subset or each one of us take a section and uh, based upon the documentation you've given us, you know, create some, you know, uh, volunteer some text. Okay, so for, so for the ask of the committee is to review your table of contents and provide you comments on any changes by, for next meeting. Correct. Or even before next meeting, so you can or revise it. Yeah, yeah. My, so. my other question: Have we taken this table of contents and laid it next to any other RFPs in other towns yet? Yes. Well, what he did is he he does. Okay. He, he I just want to make sure I, I, I might have missed. So this is so I just can you just I might have missed it when I went to the restroom or something. But where did you generate these bullet points from mm -hmm. again? One more time. This is from I think there was a nine documents that was distributed. So there's. Three from the Groton uh, and three or four from some other towns. So I went through all their table of contents and information and compressed them together to get the master list. In other words, there was a lot more in one document. Oh, Larry, you're muted. You're muted, Larry. Well, I just explained it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, uh, I'm sitting here talking to myself. So no, I it it was from all those documents. So I extracted all the uh, let's call it the table of contents from those documents, smashed them all together, eliminated redundancies, um, and you know, for example, the evaluation, developer and selection process was much more detailed in one town's document than another town's document, right? Uh, the attachments and the and the contractual details were in one document versus another. So I think, not saying I'm 100% right, but I think I captured that which was distributed, right? Mm -hmm. In terms, which is why there might be more than we need rather than less. I tried to err on the side of inclusivity rather than deleting. Is there is there any, I mean, and this might be too late now, is there, because sometimes for me to see a big picture, I have to see like what, you said some of Groton. Is there a way to go back and once again, this is just how I process to kind of highlight on here what was actually already on Groton's, and then the rest, you know, came from elsewhere. I uh, that, that, that's fine if you can't. I, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll, I, that's a, I can that's a different, it. okay, thanks. That, no, no, that's, no, a I'll, that's I'll, what I'll, I did, but I didn't document yeah. each piece. No, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the question would be then the literature that was under each of these areas, then now kind of contextual. You know, Trying to figure out, um, yeah, okay, thank you. That's what we'll do next. Once we fine tune this, we'll, we'll yeah, look at I'm interested to see their read on council and how many counselors and the scoring and the confidentiality, like what you know, what they were doing in that area. Yeah. They, they didn't have a lot of that in there, you know, they had the criteria and scoring methodology, but for specific, remember, these are for specific proposals, so right. they didn't have what we talked about earlier of, of what's your policy statements. So, and the last piece I want to toss out for consideration is give some thought to whether or not you want to make the recommendation of all counselors review this information. I mean, ultimately, it's going to be approved by council and council may decide not to do that. But there was some discussion, it seems to be, uh, to give that consideration as well. But that's uh, 
pretty much everything we had planned. Any questions from anyone? This is a very, very productive meeting. Thank you all. Thank you for your work, Bob. Thank you for your work, Larry. And thank you, everyone else, and for your future work. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Nice job, Bob, Larry. Everybody. Any comments? Oh, Scott. I'm sorry. What'd you say, Scott? I just said, nice job, everybody. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Yep, I'm good. All good. Yeah. All right. I need to hear a motion. Is it 1 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Can we keep going? <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> I got all night. <laughs> Scott, you're sounding a little tired. Don't, don't lie, because I'm feeling tired. <laughs> well, let me tell you, today was tough. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> All right, chain of motion. Motion to adjourn. I'll second. Second. Oh. Second. Hell, second. All in favor of the motion to adjourn. Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Bye bye. Thanks. Yep. Take care. Blow up at your meeting. Uh, I don't know that it was a blow up. I just think it was. Uh, Standard operating uh, procedures. I think it was. <laughs> a, uh, um, he said still being recorded, by the way. It's bad when I'm getting.